And we're off. Hello and uh, welcome to this controller session. It is, of course, with uh, Jay Hunt. And if you don't know, she's the controller of Channel 4. You really, I suppose, shouldn't be here. Maybe you should be in the goggle box session. Um, we want to get you involved. As you know, if you've been to sessions, I'm sure you all have uh, earlier this morning. If you've got any questions and if you haven't already, you've got to download the app, uh, Edinburgh, search for Edinburgh television in the app store. Once you get the app, either on your phone or your iPad or tablet, uh, you will then find on the, on the tablet, you will find pictures of the controllers. Um, just tap Jay's face and uh, I've come a lot of questions. There are some already there. Now you can contribute in two ways and it is all anonymous. I'm sure you know by now. Uh, you can either like, agree with uh, one of the comments or thoughts that's already been put there and that will push it up the order in terms of the, uh, the top uh, tweets, well, they're not tweets, but the top comments, or you can add a new one and that will come in there on the latest. It's just ever so slightly different if you're going to do it on your phone. When you get into the app, the controller button, which gives you access to this particular session, is the small icon on the bottom right if you want to get involved. So, uh, and we certainly hope we y you will. Um, if you were, uh, let's say hello, Jay, thank you very <laughs> much for, for coming along after all that stuff. If you were um, sending a question or a thought into the app to Jay Hunt, what would it be? Oh, that's really hard, actually. I'm sure people okay. have got much better questions than I have. Um, someone asked me something the other day which I thought was quite funny, is if I had to choose a Gogglebox family, which one would I live with? All right, so you've posed that question, and this is weird, and I'm now putting it to you. Which one would it be? It's interesting, because I think everyone thinks um, the posh couple, actually, Steph and Dom, who I think are entertaining uh, a lot more people next door, but I think I'll probably go June and Leon, actually. I'm a big Leon fan. Why? Because I think he's one of those extraordinary people who defies your expectations. You think I know? You think you know who he is? You think he's a man of a certain age? He'll have certain political beliefs. Mm. He'll be quite intolerant. He might even be a bit racist. And he's completely the opposite. And there's yeah. something unbelievably charming about him sitting there with his crackers and cheese, losing weight. So <laughs> I think I'll probably go Julian Leon. Yeah. Got more radical. We've got lots more questions about Gogglebots coming up. But thanks very much for that. Just to give you an idea of the the, the tone and the direction of the session. I'm sure many of you were here last year. Jay certainly was. Um, one of the most talked about events at the festival. Uh, I wasn't even here, but I heard about it. Uh, people were looking to see you under pressure. You were under some pressure, weren't you? Um, uh, do you feel more relaxed? I mean, you look more relaxed. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I think last year was a tough year in some respects. I mean, it was tough in terms of performance, but I think one of the reasons that I felt quite bullish then and I feel even more bullish now is that I had oversight of what was coming up. And mm. I think it was a really weird year in a sense that Edinburgh fell just at the moment where we'd begun to turn a corner. The mill had come into the schedule. We had Southcliffe. We ended the year with a huge amount of critical recognition and we're now sitting in our year later having picked up more awards than we have at any time in the past decade with Channel 4 up in peak for all audiences, the portfolio scene, right, games, right, right, right. blah, blah, we'll get, blah. We'll so, we'll get on to all that, But I mean, you know, did you feel more defensive then? The questions haven't gone away, the hard questions haven't gone away about I Channel don't, 4, I didn't, have they? I didn't feel defensive. I mean, I've been really clear. I was brought mm. in three and a half years ago to turn around a channel that had almost nothing in development, that had lost 200 hours of Big Brother, that needed to be rebuilt, frankly. And okay. we needed to renew some of the old franchises and start again. And I think we've now got a new raft of hits. That's forming the spine of a new schedule, which is proving very competitive. So, yeah, I feel very happy with where we're at. Okay, we're going this to is be... weird the way people still keep coming in. No, no, yeah, well, no, it's nice. Come on, <laughs> come, come on in. Just come across. It's relaxed and open. Come and, and sit up here. Yeah, come along. Uh, and, uh, yeah, you're just in time for this uh, gentle introduction to, uh, to Jay Hunt and Channel 4. And, uh, I mean, Jay, the... You know, as I say, the questions haven't gone away. And just to tell you, we are therefore going to be, be, be putting some of those, uh, those questions about the direction of travel. I also wanted to be informative to those of you that uh, may want to, to pitch in the future, have ideas and uh, things that you feel may work on Channel 4, just what is going through Jay's mind, what they're looking for. I mean, you touched on, I mean, the, you know, the perennial question, the, the big brother issue, the hero show, whatever it is, you know what that might be. Well, if you knew, you wouldn't be uh, perhaps sitting here. Um, but OK, so let's continue uh, with, the, with the idea that you've raised there, that this, is, um, that this has been you know, a good year for you. But I want to find out more about you, first of all. Three and a half years, as you say there, in the job. Let's, get, let, 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 let's just get a sense of, of you. You've, what was, you were born in Australia, weren't you? Yeah. Lived in Greece. Yeah. But in Pittsburgh. But in yeah. the USA. Yeah. And then what? Then college, school and college in, yeah. in the United Kingdom. I mean, is that, does that make you restless? Or are you, I mean, or are you rooted? No, I don't think I'm restless. I think, I mean, anyone who knows me well knows I love traveling. I'm sort of fascinated by the mm. world. I'm kind of endlessly curious. And I suppose 
you know, it's odd actually having had that as an upbringing, because if you're picked up and dumped in different environments again and again and again, I think it probably gives you a certain resilience as a child, and that's probably quite, been quite useful, frankly, in, in these jobs mm. as the years have gone by. But, um, but a bit I of think, an outsider, maybe? Yeah, and I think the outsider thing is one of the reasons why I love Channel 4, genuinely. It's one of the reasons the job was very attractive to me in the first place, is something about that sense of Channel 4 challenging authority, being iconoclastic in the way that it approaches things, which speaks to who I am. And, and I think from that sense, I, I feel like a good fit for the channel, and the channel's been a very good fit for me. Okay, uh, are you a news and current affairs person at heart? Because you know, you and I, you know, we, we crossed over when we were yeah. both at the at the BBC. You know, I've stayed for for my entire career in the in that arena. You've moved Not. out. Do, do, <laughs> do you miss it, or do you, do you like having a? I don't, I don't miss it. I mean, I think there's a really odd thing when you've had a foot in both worlds. In my experience, people in news are often in awe of people in television. They can see particularly drama as a kind of whole skill set that they don't understand. And often people in television are in awe of people from news because they think they're very clever and they, they can do lots of different things. I mean, I think to have had the opportunity to work in both worlds is incredibly exhilarating. And I think I was, I was speaking to some young people this morning. I think having experience in news at some point in your career is incredibly helpful because it helps you with storytelling. And in the end, everything we're doing all the time is storytelling. That's true. Yeah, and we were discussing a little bit uh, earlier weren't we about how that how that ability to yeah. tell stories uh, feeds through into so many of the genres we're going to talk about them now you've touched on the success and look you know no one can gainsay what channel 4 has achieved in terms of the awards it's it's garnered over the last year i mean and look at the united states i mean one one hit makes it look at netflix you, let's see i'm just going to go through the list for you because i'm sure you will um, <laughs> 27 BAFTA nominations, eight BAFTA television wins, quite amazing, nine RTS program awards, six RTS journalism awards, and you've even won Best Soap for, for Hollyoaks. Um, first time that's happened yeah, ever. since 1999, yeah. or, or Corey or, or EastEnders. Um, I mean, how does that feel? I mean, are you, <laughs> no, it's not a nice well, question. Um, but, um, uh, but aren't you worried it could be a high watermark? No, I mean, you know, I think at the end of the day, wh why that, that is a massive thrill because that represents a huge amount of work by production companies, by the commissioning team, backing shows that were hugely risky that we've managed to pull off. And I mean, that's what we're there to do. We're there to innovate. So being recognized critically is important for Channel 4 because part of what we are set up to achieve is to, to break the mold, to try different things. And most of that recognition comes for things that did precisely that, the busted genres that, you know, something like The Island, which had not been seen before in quite that form, or, you know, The Last Leg, picking up an RTS Entertainment Award, showcasing disabled mm. talent. So I think that recognition matters because us pushing the boundaries and setting the agenda for other channels is a fundamental part of Channel 4. Is there one of those you're proudest of? I mean, would, uh, I mean there's many more that yeah, won the awards, you know, but you, you, you had say, a few it's there. Been a, Which it's one been are you an proudest amazing, of? Yeah, well, I think the last leg and the way it's grown into a show which can do satirical news coverage with a light touch, which showcases disabled talent is an extraordinary thing no one else would do. One of the ones I'm most proud of, and all credit to, to Liam and the guys of Princess for this, is The Island, actually, because, you know, from the outside, really? for us to have ceded control of a show like that to 13 guys living on an island, we didn't quite know what was going to happen, and what we ended up with was something that was not only a hit, but I thought was a kind of compelling insight into the nature of modern masculinity is an amazing thing mm. to have pulled off. And I think those sort of hybrid formats are when the channel's at its most exciting. And you like the, the controversy it causes in the discussion as yeah, well. Yeah, but as I, mean, I say, we went in, but, 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 yeah, but exactly, it? we went Stirling's into it hoping, hoping for exactly that. That started as a show that said, what's it like being a British man today when at one end of the day you're expected to do the nursery drop off and then someone says, can you put up some shelves and could you start a campfire? So, you know, that notion of what it is to be a man, I think is just a sort of big theme we should be tackling. Well, listen, this is my question. This is the, the preamble. The, the Guardian uh, uh, Festival people are obviously, uh, you know, uh, uh, build it as this. This is top of uh, the app here. It's been an award-winning year for Channel 4. 27 BAFTA nods, eight wins, but are the viewers enjoying the shows as much as the judges? Are they? I mean, you haven't well, again, got, so the, sorry, you haven't got the audiences that. there, have you? Well, no, but that's not true. I mean, if you look at the top 20, of the top 30 shows, highest rating shows that we have, 26 of them have we've invented in the past couple of years, and most of them are high rating. So you look at the things that have picked up awards for us, Educating Yorkshire, a massive, massive hit for us. Bedlam, yeah. discreet but important hit for us. Last Leg cons consistently delivers well for us as well. So I don't think it, it's an either or. The Island, massive hit. Royal Marines, a massive hit. So, so there are volume... Uh, propositions on the channel and they're not it's not I think in a sense where Channel 4 used to be years ago there was Big Brother which did audiences and then this slight schizophrenia of everything else that might court awards I think we're in a much healthier place now where the shows that are delivering audiences of two three Benefit Street five million more of them. are also okay. the ones that are being recognized critically and we were much more about those very subjects coming up but we've asked all our controllers those of you that have been at sessions will be familiar with the format I, I guess by now for four uh, different clips to bring along with you, so to speak, or send in advance. And we'll start, obviously, given the, the broader brush we're using at the moment, with your, your channel-defining 
moment or your channel defining program and you, you mentioned what it is, you will recognize it instantly as we, we play this clip. So why is it channel defining though? I mean, great Honestly, stuff, it's obviously. It's an extraordinary show that I think Educating Yorkshire is a sort of evolution of the rig. We, in a sense, it tells a really good story about backing risk taking. You know, we'd done Educating Essex, which was a great show, but had not delivered massive volume. I think Mark Raff and the guys at 2.4 had done an amazing job identifying this school and it just hit that chord, it had that warmth, it told you about what it's like being young in Britain today, and it's just an extraordinary, extraordinary show. In fact, today, the, the team are back at in Dewsbury picking up the exam results, which will be cut into the show, which goes out tonight, one year on. And I think those sorts of hair-raising ways in which we continue to innovate with that form are really exciting. Is that one of your ideas? I mean, as we, we just discussed, you're from news. Now, to me, that's very familiar. Of course, you report it's one of the hardy perennials yeah. of news that you report from schools on the exam results day. But they're a documentary team. They, they move at slightly more ponderous pace, don't yeah, they? How did yeah, they react when they you do, said you I wanted think, that? You know, the, but the, uh, part of the exciting thing about being at Channel 4 is thinking, well, what can we do differently? And I think for a documentary to have the ambition of containing that bit of quick turnaround footage, for us to be able to, and we'll be pr promoting it off the back of the news, uh, doing the results story today, and to have the results in the show tonight, there's an incredibly moving story. One of the maths teachers who's taken two of the girls through the fifth time of taking of their GCSE in maths and we'll hear tonight whether they either got a C which is the beginning of a new life or a D and that's the end of that a, and that's but, amazing. But a little clue for documentary makers out there that you know you have to be able to to be fast and slow, long form, short form, you have to you have to be able to mix it up. I think you have to be able to innovate and form. I mean, one of the other things I can announce today that we're doing is the next rig show, which is extraordinary really, will be shot in southwest Ethiopia inside a tribe. So we're taking that that uh, you know rig technology mm. and saying, well, okay, let's look at the universality of themes that come across when you deal with an entirely different community that has a totally different way of life. And what will it be like to have the rig embedded in a tribe where they don't speak English? So David Brindley is probably here somewhere now, is packing a tent to go out to Ethiopia. Uh, to start the filming on that. So, again, us continuing to innovate with that form is important. But I want to ask you about, you know, this issue of risk, and you did describe educating Yorkshire as risky. Now, the risk being a technical one as much as anything, or would anything happen, or would you get anything out oh, of it? Or would anyone but, watch but, it? You know, yeah, indeed. But, you know, heartwarming, spine-tingling moment, that. Yeah. I mean, fantastic. You know, we all, we all love it. Yeah. But, I mean, is it Channel 4? Is it risky enough for to be channel defined well would that show have been we on any other channel? channel no i don't but think is it, it risky? would have been yeah i think it is risky as Edgy. i say you know the, the funny thing about that and you saw it the first time around with essex is the notion of a documentary in a school i mean traditionally i'm sure a lot of people in this room have been turned down by controllers saying education doesn't rate schools don't rate mm -hmm. And it's true, mostly they don't rate. So, you know, in its form, it's a territory that's notoriously difficult to get a broad audience to. It doesn't speak to a broad mm. audience. It's a quite rarefied experience about a particular life stage. It's got a technology at its heart that is complex. It's got huge duty of care issues. And you're trying to weave complex narratives after a very close space. So, to me, it's risk taking on a number of different levels. And it, and it turned into a great hit and, and multi award winning and quite right, too. Okay, indeed. And, and with the audience as well. Um, but edgy. Yeah. So the, mes the message goes out there. I mean, I'm just, you know, trying to push you there to, we need more things like this. this is the way Channel 4... Not yeah, but I think yeah. most people in the room, I'm sure we've got lots of suppliers in the room, I think you're very clear about that. You know, people bring shows to us which have a particular sensibility about them that feel like they are pushing the boundaries or are different or do represent a technological innovation because, you know, I'm sure you've often had us feedback. That's a great show, but it's a BBC Two or a BBC One show. We're there mm. to do something different, and I think we're very clear that we brief in that way. Let me talk about, I mean, we're talking about the award-winning shows. Um, nom nomination this time around, wasn't it, for, for education, edu Educating Yorkshire. Now, one with, I think it garnered more awards for you than international awards as well than, uh, than any other of your programmes, uh, Syria Across the Lines. Mm -hmm. I mean, unbelievable, uh, made by True Vision, which one, and particularly pertinent, yeah. given the, the questions and answers we need in, in, in this environment at the moment. But... You know, this is this is the age-old problem, isn't it? That the audience didn't really see it. Two point nine percent share lost the slot. What was it five hundred thousand viewers at peak? I mean, how do you address things like that, given the you, you, the current affairs the feelings? Goes, that you, don't, you don't address them. You just say, you know, and this is absolutely part of who I am. Are we there to do shows like that? Was it important we did Nigeria's Hidden War earlier in the week, or the extraordinary film we did earlier in the year about the homosexual community in Russia and the persecution they faced? Definitely. Do I think we will ever get mass audiences to those shows? Never. No. <laughs> Is it absolutely vitally important that we do them without a shadow of a doubt? So the complexity of the DNA of Channel 4 and us paying our way commercially is a large part of my job is thinking right we need to we need to do that film but on isn't, Syria. It, I mean, isn't it one of the, your core audiences though factual program no but not in something like that those uh, you know international current affairs anyone in this room will tell you is an incredibly difficult thing to get an audience to i think what is exciting about four is that if we can get the audiences in for other sorts of shows then we can carry 
not getting a massive audience for that. And I think one of the things I'm really proud of is we, um, you know, the BBC Trust has praised us for it. We have continued to showcase those big current affairs shows, knowing they won't get big audiences. We've continued to commission them and to put them out prominently. And that's a really important part of Channel 4. And the age range, of course. I mean, you know, the, the holy grail, the 18 to 34s. Did you get enough of them? I mean, because oh, the, I, the, the biggest chunk was over 65, Yeah, but wasn't it? and I'm not in the slightest bit surprised by that. As yeah. you know, News and Current Affairs tends to deliver a much older Absolutely. audience. It's a challenge for all of us, and I think there's a session on it at Edinburgh, isn't there, about how you get younger audiences. Mm. But it, I just think it, the picture's slightly more complex than that. We are not trying to balance within individual shows. My ambition is not that Syria Crossing the Line will suddenly get an audience of 5 million. The sweet spot for us, and I think Benefit Street's a very good example of it, but there are many others, are when we find those big topical issues and we're able to get a huge audience to them as well. But there will also be things that, you know, the amazing award-winning film we did on female genital mutilation. I didn't commission mm. that thinking this is the X factor. You know, I mean, I, 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 you, know you, you, you know what you're doing when you call them. Yeah, I mean, you know, but do you, do you feel almost it's unfair in a way? You know, Danny Cohen was sitting in that chair talking to me earlier this morning about a similar kind of program, Children of Syria, when we go back to Syria. Similar audience share, you know, similar, similar numbers, but it's on the BBC. You need to say it's public service, we take a bit of risk, and, you know, yeah, he doesn't have the commercial... Absolutely. I mean, do you miss that? No, because, you know... The reason this job is complex and the reason this job is ex exhilarating and the reason that I can see half my commissioning team sitting on the roads back there, I think they all work there, is because walking that line is utterly thrilling. You know, can we pull it off? Can we get, you know, and the most amazing thing about the recent history of Channel 4 is our revenues are entirely stable. We continue to maintain the share at 11% roughly for the portfolio, 6% for the main channel, while mopping up in news and current affairs, winning news programme of the year, dominating the current affairs award, dominating the single documentary categories. And that's because we've got that mix about right. But, you All know, right. it's a constant battle. Let's get away from the numbers again. You, too many numbers going around at the moment. We'll get, we'll get back to them, though. Uh, we, I've just been asking you about risk. And you've, been, you've brought along with your, what you define as your riskiest uh, programme, and it's Live From Space. Um, well, I'll ask you now, why was that your riskiest programme? Any clues, anyone? <laughs> I mean, what? Well, you know, honestly, because as it went on air, this genuinely happened. We heard that at one point in the um, the going around the world bit, we would lose signal and we would go to black. Now you know what this is like in a live news environment. We've got a live show with Dermot in Houston, and we know that if we get the timing yeah, okay. wrong, we will go to black on yeah. Channel Four. And the promise, which we've been marketing for two and a half weeks, is we're we're circumnavigating the world. Slightly tricky when you cut to a black shot. So. Technically, Technicals. unbelievably difficult, incredibly difficult to pull off, never been done before. It's a TV first, and so I think, mm. you know, it represents a massive risk in that respect. And the other thing I'm really proud of, and a lot of you will have had this from controllers, space notoriously does not rate, very difficult to get an audience to. <laughs> uh, and yet we've got large audiences to it and a good young audience as well, so uh, I'm really proud of it. Let's have a look. So what's the next risk you're going to take? Is it going to be a technical one? Or? I don't know, I mean, I think um, th that was an amazing way of bringing live into the schedule. And one of the things I'm fascinated by as a channel controller that runs a channel that has a particularly young audience is how do we continue to make the linear schedule completely compelling to people and, and those sorts of moments where you feel you can't miss it which just totally ignite on social media it went nuts on twitter as soon as we launched it are really interesting and you know i'd suddenly say to the producers in the room i mean we, you know we've toyed with going to the center of the earth and looking at the bottom of the sea but i mean what else have we got that feels an unmissable moment and i think that notion of channel four in these ex ex exploration formats d delivering things that you couldn't see you've never seen before is an interesting one and that, you know we're not going to find hundreds of them but okay. i think to be thinking in that vein is the right way to go well thanks for that thoughts to uh, channel four please i mean there are many definitions of risk i mean you've you talked about uh, technical risks and things like that of course comedy brings Dif risks of a different kind. Sure. Have you got really a slate of risky comedy either on Channel 4 at the moment or arriving on Channel 4 that, that you're happy with and again you, that you think addresses the, the core DNA of the Channel 4 audience? Yeah, I think, you know, it's funny you say, have you got risky comedy? I think any comedy producers in the room would acknowledge that comedy is risky yeah, per well, se. Whether, I mean, you know, that ghastly phrase, it's a market failure yeah. genre. I mean, it's traditionally unpopular to commercial broadcasters because it's notoriously difficult to land. So, I mean, the comedy strategy under Phil, which I completely endorse and it feels right to me, is that we have shows like Toast of London, which are probably always going to be slightly smaller because they're brilliant but surreal and are probably not going to be those big laugh out loud mainstream hits. And alongside those, we, we cultivate shows that have got more mainstream appeal. In fact, I'm disappointed in the sense that you're all here because there's a screening of Catastrophe, which is Sharon Horgan and Rob Delaney's right. new comedy happening somewhere down the road, which is a big, broad, beautifully written piece, which, you know, when you think about the slate as being a mix of those mainstream hits and also the cult hits, I think that's where we want to be in terms of... Okay, well, stay with risk. I mean, and this is one of the... I will bring in one of these questions uh, from the, the, the app and related to risk and put it in terms of entertainment. 
um, you know, is the singer takes it all. Is that, is that your risky entertainment show then? Is it a risky entertainment show? I think, yeah, anyone who's been in that gallery would say it's a pretty risky well, entertainment show. Well, because that's what the, the question yeah. says, yeah, are you happy with it? I, mean, I, I are think you the other thing it? is, I mean, that, I, that has been a, a quite extraordinary, actually. I mean, one of the things I love about being at Four is that we can take a punt like that. I mean, I think we've got up to something like 20 million votes now, and the bit that's extraordinary and hard to get your head around is this is ceding complete control to the audience. So I had a quite funny conversation with Justin Gorman about a couple of episodes ago about going, well, I'm not sure if that song really works. And he went, no, I know, but that's what they chose to sing. And when you let that hang in the air, you think, this is what it's like to cede control for a format to the audience, that they'll decide mm. who stays, they'll decide what they'll sing. And I think for us to be experimenting that idea of ceding editorial control to the audience, of them intervening on a live format and determining an outcome, is extraordinarily groundbreaking, and it builds on a lot of the success we'd had with things like the Million Pound Drop app. So, yeah, we're really pleased with it. And, and what are you finding? I mean, that app is, is crucial, isn't it? That, yeah. that audience participation, yeah. you know, what are you finding in, well, terms, say, of, in terms of the demographic? Uh, are, are they watching? Are they tweeting each other about it yeah, as well? Yeah, they are. They're tweeting about it. I can't, I mean, Justin's probably here somewhere. We've got a huge number of clips have been uploaded. As I say, I think it's nearing 20 million uh, votes now in terms of people choosing who they want to see on the screen. I think, you know, there are things with the show that I'm sure that we'd change, but as an insight into a way in which you can engage an audience with direct feedback uh, on the outcome of an entertainment show. It's exactly the sort of experimentation we should be involved in. Okay, and the, the, the specific question about, uh, about it was, uh, are you happy with it in spite of the technical issues that it seems yeah, to be affected I mean, you know, by? To those of you who watched the first episode, I mean, that we had some technical issues with the first app. Since then, it's been completely seamless and even more breathtaking in a way. It has held the young share absolutely comparable with Big Brother. And I think that's amazing because you know, when I arrived, we were thinking, mm. what can deliver young audiences for Channel 4 now that Big Brother's not there? This is a brand new show, which has still got a way to go, I think, in terms of working out all the dynamics of it, delivering a young share that's comparable with Big Brother. Hooray. Okay, so what are you looking at? No, I mean, how do you sustain this, you know, the, the hooray? What, 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 what are you looking at for the, <laughs> I mean, I say the, it for longer, for the next big hits? Yeah, <laughs> hurrah! Hurrah! Um, in entertainment, you mean, or yeah, in everything? Well, let's stay with entertainment okay. first and then, go, then, then give us an um, everything. I think in entertainment that, you know, we, one of the commitments I gave when I got there, which we've stuck to quite religiously with varying degrees of success, is that Friday night would be a comedy entertainment night on Channel 4. Right. And I mean, you'll see now that Gogglebox has joined that lineup and has been a, a massive hit for us there. But there's a constant need for comedy and entertainment on a, on a Friday night, and that does need to be mainstream and broad and the sorts of things we'd have an expectation will deliver an audience. I'm also looking, and this is a general cry out, not to entertainment, but to all genres. We desperately need 10 o'clock series, and I've been banging on about it for three years, and I'm, bo I'm boring myself now, but okay. you know, this is a huge opportunity for us. In the nicest possible way, we've got news on two other channels, a big young audience available to watch something who will otherwise disappear off to digital. What can we do that is a series that will play at 10 o'clock. It might be fact dent, it might be ent, it might be a reinvention of the panel show, it might be a, the absolute antithesis of that, but another way into something that feels a good alternative to news, a desperate craving for in that slot. All right, well, we've, we've been skirting around it, haven't we? We've got to talk about goggle blocks. Um, Rumours are it wasn't your first choice. Were you, were you in a position that you, you had to be persuaded? No. I mean, you know, it was no, a bit no, of a no. punt. That was a bit of a risk, wasn't it? A it bunch was a of people risk. sitting I mean, around scratching themselves watching TV. No, but it's funny, actually. One of the clips you asked us to choose is uh, what was I thinking? And the best example of what was I thinking is Gogglebox. I mean, the downside of having a news background is you can see the headline before you open your mouth. And the headline, obviously, is, you know, is this what we're reduced to? People watching, people watching television. Yes! <laughs> and it's a massive <laughs> hit. So I think... You know, those shows which uh, feel, in a sense, the simplicity of them is the very risk of them. Uh, the, uh, the extraordinary story of Gogglebox, and it's a very Channel 4 story, is the first incarnation of it didn't quite work. It was a kind of list show with clips, and we didn't like it, and Studio Lambert didn't do it. The first series, frankly, didn't really do well enough to merit coming back. The second series did slightly better and had that thing that Schedulers love, which is a tick in terms of performance, so it goes down but then goes up again. And we then took a huge punt on moving it to a Friday at nine, and now mm. it's doing audiences of three and a half, nearly four million. So I think it's a story about experimentation, about different iterations of something and persisting until you get it right. And about casting, isn't it? I mean, the casting yeah, about, must be so different. It's beautifully, beautifully cast. But again, I think at its heart, uh, you know, it, 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 it is so simple, it's brilliant, but it is so simple, it could have mm. been a disaster. But is it a Channel 4 show? I mean, could it, could it play anywhere else okay maybe to get it on there but, but again i think you know part of what channel four is there to do is to experiment that the channel fourness of that show is not necessarily the content though again i don't i can't think of any other channel that would happily and there are some weeks where i could curse them for it will let people on their own channel sit there and critique their own shows yeah i mean there are weeks when you think oh give us a break guys <laughs> you know you know the goggle box guys on sex box was quite something to hear <laughs> but i mean you dodge that question you know you say well okay you say well 
Gogglebox wasn't, wasn't a program that you had to be persuaded about. I mean, just give me a sense into you, because you know, you've done it, haven't you? You've, you've been there, you've run the, you've run the channel, you've picked the, you pick the shows individually. How involved are you in everything that appears on your channel, on channel four? Or well, it depends, will you, will you sit, you will you sit back and say, okay, I might not actually like that, but uh, you know, you brought it to me, you believe in it, I'll give it a run. Well, I mean, well, I quite happily get my commissioners to answer that. I mean, yeah. I think the honest answer is, and I've said this loads of times before, if I commissioned that channel for me, it would not look the way it does. As a matter of course, day in, day out, I am buying shows that are not to my taste. And there are several reasons for that. I'm not typical of the audience. That's really important to acknowledge. And the second thing is you employ talented, creative people who you believe in because you want their sensibility in the mix. So it's really important to me that when we look at the schedule, we can think that's a very Anna Morales show or that's a very Emma Cooper show mm. or that's exactly what David Brindley will do or that feels like Don Bird to me. That it's important that those personalities are on the channel as well. And I think it feels like that now. Mm. Do you miss Big Brother? I mean, you've mentioned it twice already about how well some of your shows have done when they're up against yeah. Big Brother. Of course, I mean, you've handed it to Channel 5 on a plate. You've got two of your Channel 4 stars appearing in the current yeah. series. Yeah, but you could turn that on its head. I mean, I yeah, think well, it's an extraordinary situation. Yeah, well, it's television isn't it? Channel yeah, but, 5. I mean, you know, you, you've said it. You do miss Big Brother. You miss the audience. No, 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 what, no, it, no. what it allowed Channel 4 to do elsewhere. No, that's... I, I mean, Dermot, again, I've, I've answered this lots of times over the past few years. I mean, I, I came to Channel 4 knowing Big Brother wasn't going to be yeah. there. I wouldn't have come had it still been there mm. because the, the Channel 4 then, to me, had at its heart something that was quite schizophrenic. It had a big show that delivered audiences and it spent a lot of the rest of the year delivering public service content to sort of balance that up. And yeah. it drifted to a point where it was a show that people were slightly embarrassed was there. So, you know, I think what we're trying to do now, which is tougher without a shadow Broader of a doubt, slate. Is, no, is to have a slate where, where we are balancing up the hits and the public service and in, in the perfect world getting big public service hits, which is what I think the past year has been about. But do we miss it? No, we honestly don't miss but it. But it's allowed Channel 5 to become the hot breath on your back. So, you know, you're talking about a 6% audience audience share and you know they're going well we got five and yeah but well first of all I mean, again it, by all audience measures we are doing consistently better than channel five and in fact quite frequently e4 is outperforming channel five so I, I, I that doesn't really worry me at all and if anything actually i'm less worried about channel five than i've been at any point in my time at the channel for really very, why well for very simple <coughs> reason They're, the trajectory they are on editorially is very very clear it is overtly commercial they are trying to do something that we are not trying to do and so i think the clear blue water between us and five is more marked than it's been mm. at any time in the past but, uh, five yeah years. but i mean just on the ratings they're very close to you at eight o'clock aren't they well no th sometimes they're close to eight sometimes they're not and frankly if you're sitting there saying look here's a feature show and guess what it took down an international current affairs show well, yeah yeah i suspect sure. it did <laughs> yeah. i don't really care i mean i think you know we are trying to do something which is delivering a big public service innovative channel which takes huge creative risks it's a very different remix but you know a lot about them i mean you're thinking you're studying what you know you're studying the audiences they're getting that's any, what you do any channel controller you ask if they're not aware of the competition i'd be very surprised all right well let's play your uh, next clip you mentioned it there uh, that uh, gogglebox well, you know in its uh, in its earlier iterations may have been a, a candidate for this the what was i thinking program moment you actually went for first dates which i'm shocked about it went down well in well in our house but uh, let's have a look at the clip for those of you not familiar with it so what was i thinking is well, why did I, I pull it or you no, know why no did no I no i think what's interesting about that show is and again people in the room will know this dating show is notoriously difficult to get a big audience yeah. to so in a sense it's kind of crazy thing to have gone for um nick mersky championed it actually which is an unlikely uh, supporter for that show but he's done a great job with it i mean what was i thinking i suppose really relates to the fact that that will come back for a third series it's never quite got there in terms of audience but I think there's a germ of something in that, which when we crack could be as big as Gogglebox. And I, and I feel okay. passionate when we find something that's got that DNA that feels very Channel 4, that we persist and we get it right. All right and so we it's not really it what, I, what was I thinking, because you know, you pulled shows in their, during their runs that uh, obviously didn't do well for you. What were you got in the 8 p.m. slot I mentioned? Hollywood Me and Compare Your Life. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you choose something like that? Well, I'm very happy to talk about those. I mean, those were punts at eight o'clock that didn't quite get there. I think sometimes there are shows which you think are flawed and actually they're just not going to quite get there. Sometimes there are shows, and Gogglebox was an early example, I think First Dates is another good one, of something you may not have got quite right yet. Okay. And that's a different category yeah, yeah. of shows. And you've got to do that. You've yeah. got to take risks, as we've discussed. But, you know, you're being very honest here. And again, for, for the, uh, the audience, the providers, the content providers out there, what, what are you getting wrong at the moment on, on Channel 4? Oh, shall we get lots of things wrong all the time? <laughs> how, I mean, you how know, long have we, we got? We have, you know, 82 new series uh, across the portfolio last year, and, and any number of those at some point won't be what we hoped they would have been. I think if you're going to make as many swings of the bat as that, then you'll have a lot of success, but you'll have a lot of failure. And I think one of the things I feel much more relaxed about. Yeah, but you're now, not just monkeys and typewriters, are you? I mean, you're not, you, you know, you're not just swings of the bat and hoping you get a hit. I mean, it's, it, it's well, no, targeted. No, I mean, I think, you know, 
one of the interesting things about telly is we only know so much, and I still think we probably all work in telly, I per partly do, because we can be surprised. We can be surprised that things that seemed an obvious call don't work. We can be surprised that things that seemed a massive punt that you know then did go on and work. So I think we're constantly taking risks, all of us, and at Channel 4 even more so, because that's what we were set up to do. Mm. And the buck stops with you. I mean, you yeah, know, we, we talked about last year. I mean, does it hurt the criticism? It, it, it stops with you. you, you get it in the neck. Yeah, but, you know, to some extent, that's the nature of the job description. I mean, if you agree to go and run a channel, any channel, then at some point, you know, it's your responsibility. It has to be your responsibility. And I think you you have to get good at accepting that that's going to mm. be the case. There isn't any other way of managing it. I mean, you know, since last year, I suppose the biggest um, media storm you've created at Channel 4, Benefit Street. Yeah. I mean, do you think that was unfair? Do you think that really was public service broadcasting? Yeah, I, I absolutely think it was public service broadcasting, and I'm extraordinarily proud of it. I mean, I think for us to have managed to create a show that engaged almost X factor levels of 16 to 34s in one of the most pressing issues that we will deal with in the run up to the next general election benefits, welfare, how mm. do we feel about supporting poorer people in society? Amazing thing to have pulled off. And yeah. I think the most thrilling bit of it in some respects is for all the people who thought, oh, this is, uh, you know, inflammatory and difficult, when you've got really good documentary makers looking at it, they said, actually, fair dues, this is a quality piece of work. So it was not only a huge hit and much mm. talked about, it was also a really beautifully crafted show by yeah, them. Yeah, but I mean, there was, you know, the, I'm not going to uh, uh, go over the arguments all again, but it was the misrepresenting the truth, the complaints that came from the, the residents of the, the street, some of the residents of the street themselves, you know, were you really, you said, supporting them? Yeah, but the, the funny thing, Dermot, again, I can't think of any other channel that would have said, OK, fine, bring it on if you think you're hard enough then. Let's <laughs> stage a live debate and get those people into the studio on the very channel that's transmitted this show and let's see what happens. And we did that. And then, of course, off the back of that, you know, the show has, has been uh, endorsed by Ofcom for the duty of care that was shown, particularly to the vulnerable younger people in the programme. So, I mean, I think we can be incredibly proud of how we handle a very sensitive so situation. So you think the, crit I mean, the criticism of that, do you think criticism is unfair? Do you think part of it is to do with who you are and what you represent. You know, you're a very powerful woman in a very powerful job. No, I mean, do you think some think of it is to do with your gender? No, I mean, I think on Benefit Street, you know, th that is a tabloid nirvana, isn't it? I mean, that's a, of a huge show. You've got audiences of five and a half million, hugely engaging. People are going to want to write and talk about it. It's continuing to happen now as we make Immigration Street and we will make Benefit Street again. So I, I don't think that will go away. It's also a critical political issue. So there's going to be a debate about that. I think that's much more for those reasons. Okay, question on the app. Uh, who came up with the name Benefit Street? Channel 4 or Love? Uh, love well, Productions, I mean, I you know. People think this, we've been evasive about this, and I don't think we have at all. I mean, from memory, I'll, I can't, uh, I mean, Ralph might know, actually. From memory, um, uh, Benefit Street was a, a working title that had been kicking around for quite a long time, but I know a lot of suppliers in the room will be familiar with the kick bollocks scramble, which is uh, press day, and finally resolving what we're going to call something. So I can't remember exactly at what point we decided to call it that, but it was certainly a title that had been around for a long time. Okay. I mean, does it hurt? Just back to the criticism overall. Is it water off a duck's back, or, you know, do you lie in bed at night thinking, soft heart rot, you know, that's really unfair, but I've got to take it. You know, I, I think you'd become inhuman if criticism, personal criticism, didn't hurt you. Of course it hurts you, but I, you then have to decide whether you can park it and get on with the job. And as I say, I was brought in to do a really difficult job. I was brought in to provide strong leadership at a time where it wasn't quite clear where Channel 4 was going to go next. And we sit here now you know, with the higher 16 to 34 portfolio share that we have ever had, mm. you know, and a raft of awards and a raft of new hit shows. So I'm pretty happy about where we are now. And if along the way we have to take a bit of incoming fire, then we're going to have to do but that. But is it, I mean, you know, is it anything to do with your sex? I mean, you know, you're one of the one, you're one of the most 100 powerful women in, in the country, I, I, I read. I, I don't, I mean, Radio you know, I don't know. Hour. Sometimes, I mean, sometimes how, I feel... How does that feel? I think it... Uh, how does it feel? I don't know how it feels, really. I mean, I think you're a very noticeable channel controller until very recently, and I'm thrilled that both Charlotte and Kim are in place now. Until very mm. recently, there were very few senior women, and so you're very conspicuous, particularly to the press. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, you go into this job knowing that's what you're taking on. That's what it's like to run a, a big team and a portfolio of channels, and you have to be robust in the face of that. Yeah, but Channel 4, specifically, I mean, it's already a target, whoever's running it, and then, then you come along. Do you think that's... <laughs> <laughs> extra yep. grist yeah, to the mill. Yeah, did come there. along. Did go along. That's true. <laughs> I mean, do you get fed up? I mean, I've been banging on about it. Do you get fed up just being described as a women controller? You're a controller of a channel, whether you're, it doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. Well, as to say, I am. I am the CCO of Channel Four. I run a portfolio of channels. Uh, I. I. 
I don't know. I don't know what else you want me to say. I mean, yes, I'm yes, I'm a woman, but there are now other female controllers. I think it's important to me. I spent time talking to the network guys this morning that other women feel that there are senior role models in the industry and that these jobs are within their grasp and that they can go on and do them and they feel supported to to make those sorts of decisions. But you know, I I don't think. There, there's not much point dwelling on why the criticism comes. I think it, it will mm. when you are a senior person in any role, frankly, but, regardless of But I mean, of this gender. is you know, this is a question for our society as well. You know, we talk all the time about glass ceilings and perhaps quotas and yeah. FTSE 100 companies and board level representation. It is important that we get more women into positions of power in television, like yourself. I mean, are you seeing that with your your commissioning team? Are you actively pursuing that kind of? Process. Yeah, I mean, I think we've got um, some fantastic commissioning editors who've joined the organisation recently, people like Amy Flanagan, who we're thrilled to have, who's impeccable pedigree as a doc maker and is now a commissioner for Channel 4. So, you know, personally, it, it matters to me enormously that we are getting strong women into commissioning roles who can see a career path that could lead to them being a channel controller because we need mm. to have that, you know, you know, that gender balance in the team. But it goes, you know, it goes far. I'm not saying... Well, is it positive discrimination? It may not be quotas, but it also goes for diversity as a whole when it comes to ethnic diversity as well. Yeah. Is, is that in your mind? You are thinking, right, you know, I've got it. This is Channel 4. Yeah, of course. I mean, I think, you know, the, the Lenny Henry intervention, I think, has, has prompted a debate which has been incredibly useful for the entire industry. And I've sat down recently with the other channel controllers, and I think the one thing that's very clear is there is absolute consensus. We need to get better at this. And, you know, to a certain extent... Channel 4 is already quite a long way down the road with some of this stuff. You look at the, what we've achieved in terms of disability. I see Arthur, who's one of our brilliant Paralympic talents sitting there, who is now, in fact, terrifyingly flying the world in a specially modified plane, landing at very dangerous airports. I mean, he is now a face of history on Channel 4. So we are, we are moving forward in terms of representation in areas around disability. The massive campaign we've had this year around gay rights. We've just had a huge amount of praise from this transgender community for representation there. But, but on BAME, we need to do more, and we will do more. But do you think it's too prescriptive? What Sky have done, what Stuart Murphy's been talking about recently, he said 20% quota. It's there, yeah, the target's I think, you know, there Stuart, to, to Stuart be measured against. Absolutely, but we, let, this is the critical thing. We will all be measured. And at the instigation of Channel 4 and the Creative Diversity Network, the Silver Mouse scheme will monitor what is going on air and what is going on behind the camera. And I think that is going to concentrate minds in a very serious way. I think that is going to be absolutely critical in terms of changing the debate here. I mean, Stuart was very open about the fact that 20% works for Sky, it may not work for everyone. I think we'll have a different approach, as you'd expect from Channel 4, but it doesn't mean we take the issue any less seriously. Okay, just got to ask you, I mean, before we leave this, well, just going to leave this, I mean, you have got a reputation, let's not beat around the bush, uh, for micromanaging things. I mean, you, would you deny that, or are you just saying you, you keep attention, you, it's attention to detail? I mean, you know, on one level, we've just won loads of awards, so I think we're getting something right in terms of the quality control <laughs> no, but, yeah, on the no, channel. But that's different, do do, that's do a I different care answer. what goes on television? Absolutely, and I've yeah. answered this many times before. Am I held account for it? Yes, I am. By, by my boss, the, David Abrahams, by the board, by Ofcom, ultimately, for the quality of what's on Channel 4. But the simple fact of it is, it's hard to describe, but if you are running a network of channels like that, you can't possibly be across yeah. it all. I, I am interested and involved in the big shows that we make big decisions on that are channel-defining, because they are... You know, that, they are how we deliver the remit and they're fundamental to the future of Channel 4. So, of course, I'll be involved in those sort of shows. There are a whole variety of other shows that I have very, very little involvement in necessarily because I simply wouldn't have the time to do mm. it all. So, yes, of course, I care. I wouldn't deny that for a second. And, of course, I want to be involved in those big decisions. But there's a huge amount that I'm not involved in. OK, time's galloping by. We're going to have some uh, audience questions in a bit. But this is, this is very important. We've talked about four clips. We've uh, only had the three. You've chosen uh, three factual one drama. Um, well, we talked about the, the factual background. Does that show a personal preference? No, I mean, I was telling it our press dinner last night, one of the slight frustrations if you come from news where turnaround times are very quick is how long it takes to land really big dramas. And one of the things I'm excited about, and I know Piers is excited about too, is that we've got some of our biggest plays will be landing in the next couple of months. We will kick off next year with Indian Summer, which stars Julie Walters' this extraordinary story of love and betrayal and the creation of modern India. I should announce today, actually, as well, that we've got a single drama coming up next year about the coalition, which is about Nick Clegg and the decisions that he took about the future of the Liberal Democrats and what he was going to do at what point. And, you know, has he secured the future of the Liberal Democrats in a coalition government forever? So, so or that's has, a drama. I mean, that's it sounds a drama fascinating. that will land so, next year. Yeah. Uh, we've got another uh, big... Um, Who's playing uh, Nick Clegg? Don't know yet. <laughs> uh, big international thriller called Opposite Himself. Numbers, which we will be making in the next couple of years as well, which is about North Korea and a nuclear scientist being captured there. So some of those yep. big geopolitical plays will, will play out. 
But I think the clip we're going to talk about is from Russell T. Davis's uh, new series, which is Cucumber. Yeah. Uh, and it has a companion playlist which will play on E4 called Banana. And I suppose it's a great big, warm, beautifully written drama about what it's like being gay in Britain today. Yeah, exciting. Let's have a look at it. See one anytime soon, particularly the. Um, <laughs> Particularly the, uh, was that a chastity cod piece? Yeah, I say every time, it's funny when you play this clip, because you can see the men in the room just kind of crossing and uncrossing their legs slightly nervously. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's every bit as risque as you'd expect from the creator of Queer as Folk, and I think it's going to be utterly brilliant, actually. It's an extraordinary piece of work. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it later. So, <laughs> what does it do? <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, OK, yeah. yeah. <laughs> See you in the George at 10. <laughs> uh, we'll be discussing that. I mean, but no, you talk, you talk, this is, and this is also exciting, stripping it across channels. So that's cucumber. What's banana then? That's going to go on evil. Banana and is, it um, I had to announce this last night at a press dinner that Alan Carr was out quietly tittering in the corner <laughs> of the whole thing. But cucumber and banana are exactly what you'd think they'd be, if you're wondering. Um, and the third bit is called tofu, uh, which will sit online and is a series of more factual pieces about gay life in Britain. But the rather brilliant thing about cucumber and banana is some of the characters from cucumber appear in banana, and banana is on E4 and tells from a much younger perspective what yeah. it's like being gay in Britain today. An amazing story of diversity, actually, of LGBT writers on that series, of huge ethnic diversity on screen as well. So I think it's going to be quite something. Mm. And you say, I mean, you know, that's an E4. I'm going to speak personally from my own household with loads of teenagers in it. Um, that's addressing those 16 to 34s. Well, we would, we, you know, we, and a lot of people know this, don't they? You know, we've been discussing it. And I, you know, I see it in my own house. They watch quite a lot of Channel 4 programmes. Do you know they actually don't know they're on Channel 4? They don't know Channel 4 exists. They, it's on their planner. It's on, you should tell them. Yeah, well, I will. I definitely will. <laughs> and they certainly don't watch the ads. You know, I mean, it is a problem, yeah, isn't it? I mean, you know, it, it, just, it's we, an we industry-wide just, problem. It is, but we just glossed over E4, and I, too, have a teenage son. And the most striking thing is, I mean, if anything that was anything to do with me, he would instantly find mm. massively uncool. But he found E4, and he is now, you know, a core mm. E4 viewer. And actually, E4 is up 5% year-on-year. Mm. Series of massive hits there with The 100 and Tomorrow People and Troy and now Virtually Famous doing a job as well. So that, that in a sense, flies in the face of that. They but are they're still migrating across from, from, from the big channel, and that's where you earn the big money. So a tiny bit, but actually, you know, E4 is still a key driver of income for Channel 4 mm. as well. And for us to have in our portfolio something is, what, of total, I, don't, I mean, I've, I couldn't do that off the top of my head, but a total, a channel that is serving 1634s in a way where it's often delivering a bigger young share than BBC Two or Channel 5, massively important for us. Mm. And actually, again, in, in that way, to be able to cross-fertilise, to find shows that work on E4 that can be brought back to the main channel as well. I mean, if Channel 4 becomes more of a sort of alternative mainstream, of ha having that younger relative in the mix seems really important. Alternative mainstream for Channel 4. OK, listen, we've got time for uh, a few questions. There are people with microphones either side. Get your hands up, get the microphone to you. And we would appreciate it if you would identify yourself uh, say uh, where you're from, what organisation you are representing, and also other people get their hands up in advance so as we can use this time most efficiently. We'll have a microphone already with you. Uh, have you got one in the middle of the second row here? Well, nearly, nearly the middle anyway. Uh, Tara on La Media Guardian. Hi, Tara. Um, hi, Jay. Can I just ask a, a couple of things? Um, Immigration Street, there was talk about the title being changed there, but you said it was going to be Immigration Street. Is that still the same? Could you also bring us up to speed on Benefit Street, what's happening with that, when the next series will be, please? And also bring us up to speed on um, talks with Jeremy Paxman. And you said... So okay, a bit that's, cheating that was, now. Yeah, is that, that, is that, that, that a bit was cheating? Two, you said two that's questions, you give three three. Questions. We'll, we'll have those right. right. Well, you um, can do Benefit Street immigration, and Immigration Street. So street immigration what? Street, is it going to finally be called that? Um, to be honest, in, as everything, it won't land for many months. Uh, at the moment, that's a working title. Don't know. We'll wait and see. Uh, Benefit Street, uh, honestly don't know. I'm in the process of filming. I'm not absolutely certain when it's going to land. It will be at some point next year, probably... I'm looking at Ralph, who's sitting two seats away from you, second or third quarter, probably next year. Uh, and what was the cheaty last one? Jeremy Paxman. Jeremy Paxman. Um, are you in talks with Jeremy Paxman? I've known should Jeremy John for years. I've worked with him on Newsnight. John Snow should not be worried in any way. But have you been in talks with him? Have I talked to Jeremy? Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would, would you like to see him do something? Yeah. Tiny depends. OK. Right. Uh, any more questions? Um, get your hands up. Or was that just it was like a, an auction there? I thought you, were, thought you were bidding there. You're not... You really don't have any more questions. Well, some of you have sent, uh, as I say, plenty in here. Um, this, is, this is the question from, from the app. So some, and this has just uh, appeared, so some of you have been uh, doing this anonymously. Jay, what do you think of the decision to put BBC Three online? Are you going to be targeting 
the youth audience. I mean, you're glad about that, 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 that it presumably will, will leave yeah, behind. Yeah, I, mean, I think, you I know, mean, that, I mean, Danny was really clear that they did that sooner than they would want to have done. And I think, you know, our insight, and you can see it in the, the record performance of E4, is that you are still getting young audiences consuming content in very traditional ways. They're still watching a, a digital schedule and, and lapping that up. So yeah, as far as I'm concerned, you know, we'll, we'll have a mixed economy of stuff that is, is online. We've had record figures this year as well for 4OD and for our, our VOD uh, performance there. But, you know, the BBC have decided to do it for financial reasons. That's their decision. What my observation is, is that we're still seeing strong young audiences to digital channels. Mm. Danny, well, you mentioned Danny there. You know, Danny also uh, told me, sitting in that chair, as I say, earlier this morning, he also said uh, commissioners should change every four or five years. Do you agree with this? <laughs> Commissioners or channel controllers? Uh, he said, and controllers, commissioners and controllers. Basically, you need to freshen it up. You need to keep moving around. Yeah, You've I mean, certainly think, done that. Yeah. You've got another year and a half. <laughs> no, no I've, I've moved around. I mean, yeah, I think he's probably right. I mean, I think you, uh, certainly on a younger channel, there'll come a point yeah. when, you know, someone else should do this job. But, I mean, I suppose, what does that give me? Another year and a half, yeah. does it? Okay, well, that's nice. Well, I mean, yeah. you, that's a serious point. I mean, do you feel, do you feel like that? Do you feel you would, you would begin feel, to what, get... really old? No, uh, get a bit stale? I mean, I think, you know, one of the reasons I love working at Four and one of the reasons it's invigorating bringing in new talent into the channel all the time is that, you know, it's that odd mix of skills, isn't it? I've run channels now for the best part of a decade yeah. and, you know, you can already hear your, your head going, that won't work for these reasons, it didn't work in 2003. Incredibly important. You've got a 27-year-old who goes, but it might work this time. And you think, yeah, it might, yeah, actually. Indeed. So, you know, one way or another, whether it means there needs to be greater circulation of people, you need that cross-fertilisation, you need the people who come in who've never seen it fail before and who believe in a world of infinite possibility mm. it's going to work this time. And I, I think that's really refreshing. Good at dotting it. But, I mean, the, you know, the, the ambition. First female director general. Oh, God. You've heard it before. <laughs> but, you know... Got the qualifications? No? Yeah? No? I promise you. Never I mean, never. If the ball came loose from the rock. I, well, I, I think someone had better... Boris Johnson. I think someone had better tell Tony if that's happening. But um, uh, I am very, very happy where I am. And I, I love this job. I and mean, we're just at the point where it, it feels like we've turned a corner in quite a massive way, actually. I've got a brilliant team, shows that I love, and a channel I adore. So it's all good. OK, and we've got this, uh, you know, this just in today I want to ask you about coming. Uh, the investment in indies, that's really interesting. You know, I mean, is it a source of regret you at Channel 4 that you can't own the formats, either publisher, broadcaster. I mean, I think, so know, this, is, are, this is as close as you can get yeah, to getting, are, to getting are, some of the success feeding back in. We are a publisher, in. broadcaster. I think, it's, I think it operates on a number of levels. Yeah, it's fantastic that we can be engaged in IP in that way, but I think more interesting is it seems an absolutely appropriate role for Channel 4 to be invested in companies. Mm. And the ones that have come into the Channel 4 family uh, today, uh, we're utterly thrilled about. Uh, it's fantastic. And I'm genuinely exciting for us to have a foot in that world. But it works very differently. I mean, uh, my world sits over here, and the world that will manage that growth fund sits over here. And it's okay. important that everyone in the room knows that, because yeah. they're not coming in on a promise of work. They have to pitch All like right. everyone else. I've got, I've got another question on that. But l listen, your time is running out. If you really do want to put a question to, to Jay Hunt, we've got another couple of minutes. So get a hand up. Right, we'll, get a, well, we'll take that now. We'll get a microphone to you. If anybody else is thinking of asking a question, do. You've heard Jay for the last 55 minutes, she'll answer anything. Hi, well, Jay. <laughs> nearly. Yeah, Go right. on. Um, you mentioned you were still very invested in traditional methods of delivering to 16 to 34 year olds, which I love. I think that's really important. But every, all the brokers you mentioned, except for Banana, are all American imports. What's the next big 16 to 34 project that Channel 4 are going to be making internally or? within the UK? Well, they're not, actually. Quite a lot of the ones I mentioned are homegrown, even on E4. Virtually Famous is a new panel show. In fact, the man who commissioned it is sitting directly in front of you. You can tap him on the shoulder. Have a chat. Um, <laughs> made in Chelsea, New York. Big hit for us there. Homegrown as well. We have, coming up this autumn, really excited about a new Jack Thorne drama called Glue. First time we had Murder Mystery on E4 as well. Um, we have Drifters coming back. We've just had an old fielding in the schedule. So there's a huge amount of origination there on for 1634, specifically on E4. But in a sense, the more almost more exciting part of that is the huge young audiences we get on main channel. I mean, the Royal Marines Commando School has done a double-digit young share week after week after week. So it's also about not thinking that young audiences will only go for a certain type of content, but understanding, as I'm sure you do as a viewer, that you'll watch a wide range of things and that you'll love the island and you'll probably watch Benefit Street and dip into Marines and you might even watch a bit of The Last Egg on a Friday night and enjoy Toast as well. I mean, I think there's a lot on that channel for... My God. Young I, mean, your knowledge, I mean, we'd expect it, of course, uh, your knowledge of the... The channel. The channel share. I run. Um, yeah. Well, do you, do you, well, yeah, but everything on it. What do you like on other channels? What do you watch that isn't on Channel 4? 
Um, what do I watch? I mean, I, everyone knows this. I've answered the same question. I watch Grey's Anatomy religiously, yeah. guilty pleasure. Yeah. I love Modern Family. I wish we had Modern yeah. Family. I think Stuart knows that I wish we had Modern Family. Um, uh, the things I really admire, if I'm honest, are when people have taken huge punts and often it hasn't worked or it doesn't quite land. I mean, I, I thought, and this is a bit of a niche appeal one, this, the truth about population on BBC Two was a rather extraordinary thing. To find a way of taking factual theatre and doing a massively difficult issue like that, really interesting, very different way of doing uh, uh, yeah. something that's quite a, a dry old subject. So I watch out on other channels for things that make you think, oh, that's interesting, could we do something in that vein? Or where does that get you intellectually if you take that as a jumping off point? That they're the most interesting. OK, we're getting lots of questions in this way, but does anyone, last chance to do it verbally, if you want most powerful woman in the industry in the UK, do you want to offer a <laughs> praise or do you want to give her a, a bit of a kicking? Uh, <laughs> you, you've, got, you've got one minute. One minute, and, right, OK, good man. W which that is was, it? That was which, like which, really which in answer to the an kicking offer, bit, yeah. yeah. Let's hear Just introduce yourself. Hi, my name's Sebastian Till. Um, I run an um, online TV um, um, broadcasting channel called Art, um, Upshot Entertainment. And I was just interested to know, like... Um, Didn't I talk to you earlier? Yeah, no? yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I already answered your question. Go on, then. No, it's a different Might one. Might be a different she, one. No, it'd be exactly um, the same, I promise you. Go on. Yeah, um, <laughs> I was just wondering, like, how you manage um, telling, like, an audience when, when certain shows are, are just... They disappear. So like, you know, like um, there was Top Boy and Top Boy, there was season one, season two. And then as far as I know, it, it done pretty well. It was getting a good response and so on and so forth. And then season three is just not, it was, isn't commissioned. And like a lot of people don't know why. So I was just interested to know on how yeah, you um, manage. Fair dues, it's a different that. question. Yeah, well, um, well tell us uh, why, are you going to apologize? Uh, this is the war criminal end of the Edinburgh interview now that I realise. Um, uh, honest answer on Top Boy, really, really difficult call that. I mean, I think the second series didn't do nearly as well as the first series had done, which was disappointing, even though it got huge critical acclaim. And I think when things are struggling a little bit ratings-wise but are critically acclaimed, they end up in a sort of pot of shows which we have to look at and think, look, can we afford to go with them again? And sometimes we do. We did with Utopia, a classic example of a show that hadn't done brilliantly that we were thrilled to bring back. Sometimes we don't. Top Boy had had two series, and on a channel where we've got a kind of remit to innovate and move on and try new things we're moving on and trying new things and I, I know it had a very loyal fan base and I know those fans will be disappointed but it, we've ultimately got finite resources and we have to make some difficult decisions and on this occasion it's not coming back brilliant thank you very much indeed Jay and thank you for that question listen we've had uh, announcements new announcements we've had analysis we've had guidance on uh, on pitching to Channel 4. It's winding up the session. So thank you very much indeed for coming to, to listen to this conversation. I hope you felt it was a, a conversation. And thank you to all of you who contributed either through the app or, or verbally. I have to thank Broadcast for sponsoring this session. And uh, thanks to Louise Blythe, who's up there from the BBC Academy, who uh, helped to produce this session. And of course, many thanks. Round of applause, please, for Jay Hunt. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Jay.